Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Kenny Vaughn. He's going to share some stories about Jimi Hendrix. Oh man, it's the greatest. I saw him three times. I was at a Doors show in 1967 at a place called The Family Dog in Denver. And it was an all-ages joint, didn't serve, serve alcohol or anything. It was all white kids, and it was like a hippie light, light show and stuff, you know. And I saw a bunch of cool shows at this place. And Captain Beefheart was the opener that night. It was Captain Beefheart opening for The Doors in 1967. But they cleared the stage of the captain's gear, and they were setting up The Doors gear, and they had a DJ there that would blast music really loud over the sound system. And he would talk between songs and stuff. You know, and he says, and now here's the new Jimi Hendrix record. And I, you know, I didn't know who Jimi Hendrix was. And it, this record had just come out like that week or whatever. And the, he played Foxy Lady. I was like, what the fucking hell am I hearing, man? That's unfucking believable And I went to J.C. Penney's the next day in, in my neighborhood in the Woodlawn Shopping Center in Littleton, Colorado. Walked up there and there was a copy of Are You Experienced? You know, and I looked at the cover. I'm like, Jimi Hendrix, he must be the guy in the middle, the black guy. And those two other guys must be his band. And I thought, well, those two guys, okay, so Jimmy must be the bass player. And this guy must be the guitar player. And this guy must be the drummer. So I'm listening to this record thinking that that's what the case is, you know, because you know, it just, you know, I looked at the way they were dressed and, you know, like I didn't know what, you know, anything about him, nothing except for I'd heard that song. And this record had just come out like a few days before that, you know, and I'm playing it for my friends and stuff. And, Do you believe this? You know, you listen to this stuff. So he came to town like a couple of weeks later to the Regis Fieldhouse in Denver. So we go out there and the soft machine opened and they were fantastic one of my favorite bands of all time. They were just so good. Unbelievably artsy and, and you know, the drummer was the lead singer and he's playing in a little red Speedo and nothing else, you know, barefoot, you know, <laughs> jazz drummer, you know, singing in this crazy, you know, um, sort of Dada-esque poetry stuff over this you know, really cool music, you know, with this wicked ass organ player, they're a trio at the time and the organ player was just Mike Rattledge is way off the charts for you know jazz player and um, I'm like wow this is cool you know and then Jimi Hendrix walks on when they you know when they introduced him he's holding his upside down strat I'm like whoa and they go into this little um, quiet little shuffle that sounds like that song Up From The Skies which is the opener on his second album but that album hadn't didn't come hadn't come out yet. It was, it was, he was just he was, you know his first album was brand new. But it was that kind of a groove, just a little shuffle, and it wasn't loud. And he's just playing like a little clean thing. And he turns on his wah wahs, playing a little simple wah wah thing. And I was like, wow, okay, you know. And they end the song, no vocals or anything, you know. And then he goes, he starts hitting this note, you know, and he turns it up, and it gets louder. And louder and starts feeding back. And we're like, whoa! And all hell broke loose. Everybody stood up, like with their mouths open. And for the next, you know, hour, it was just, we couldn't believe what we were hearing and seeing, you know. And of course, he was doing all this stuff. And, you know, he's really funny. You know, I don't know if you knew that. He was on his stage patter was really humorous. Off the cuff, you know, spontaneous kind of stuff comments and stuff and uh, then I saw him um, when he played Red Rocks which uh, I think he was bummed out that night about something that wasn't his best show I, he kind of cut it short and uh, then I saw him uh, at the Denver Summer Pop Festival where, where he was really good that was a good show that was the last show that Noel Redding played well the first time I saw him I think they were using Sun amps that night and then the next two times he had his marshals. And I think the last show, well, maybe both those shows, Noel still had some sun gear for his bass. But Jimmy was playing the marshals for those two would, shows. Would that have been all stage volume that you were hearing, like out of his amps, or were they going to? There was no, um, the only time I saw him with, a, with 
when there was more than like two mics and the drums was uh, the third show where there was an actual PA system. Uh, the one at Red Rocks, it was just two voice of the theater speakers and two vocal mics and two mics and the drums. I don't think there were any mics on the amps, but he sounded really good. You know, he, you know, he wasn't loud that would hurt your ears loud. He just sounded really good. You know, it just sounded good. You know, Mitch was a jazz drummer. He didn't hit hard like, like the drummers in Nashville do. You know, he was he was had finesse. He played with a trad grip. You know, and you know he's like Elvin Jones. You know, he played soft. But he was a he played his butt off, man. He was fiery, but it wasn't about volume with him, you know. I don't see how he hurt himself. All those marshals on this side and all those bass amps on the other side, but were you hip to like fuzz pedals at this time? Did you understand how he was getting what he was getting? Yeah. Um somehow I scored a fuzz face in about uh early it was either late 68 or early 69. So that was, I had one already before the last time I saw him. And I had a box wah wah pedal like he had. I mean, I figured it out by messing around with mine because I was playing through a Fender Twin amp. And I, I kind of figured it out on my own. You know, I had a, uh, I, I started with a Tele in 66 and then I scored a Les Paul in 68. And then in 69, I, I scored a Strat. And so when I plugged the Strat into the fuzz face, I was like, okay, I kind of see how this works. In Ron Wood's book, I guess him and Hendrix lived together at one time. Oh, really? Cool. And um, I've not read that book. He said that um, Jimmy was like really self-conscious. He thought he was a terrible singer and he didn't really feel that great about his guitar playing. Yeah. It's kind of amazing, you know. Yeah, but you know. He was sensitive, you know. Yeah. He was like a cool cat, man. Well, well you know, I mean, he was really cool. You know, if you if you ever read interviews of his, the, all the shit he says, he's really a cool dude, man. A very art, artsy guy, you know. Some thoughtful. He read books, you know, obviously. He was a big science fiction fanatic. And uh, he knew a lot of stuff that people didn't realize that he knew. You know, he was well-educated. He grew up in Seattle, you know, where there wasn't, probably as much systemic racism as there would have been in other places. So he probably got a better education there because of that, you know. You know, Billy Cox were arrested at the lunch counter sit-ins here in Nashville. I didn't know that. Yeah, when he lived in Nashville and they were playing... Uh, oh, that, they played down there on Jefferson Street at the... I can't remember the name of the joint. It got destroyed when they, uh, you know, they... The city fathers, when they put in the interstate system, they saw that as an opportunity to wipe out Jefferson Street, get rid of some of those black night spots. And they, that was one of them that got demolished. It, that probably wouldn't have happened till the late 60s because it was the interstate came through here later than it did where I grew up. So what's your favorite, like, Hendrix stuff? Like an uh, album or songs or whatever? Well, you can't really beat the first one because, you know, I heard the, I had the American release, which is different from the English one, but still, it's pretty darn good. And I love the second one, and the third one blew my mind, you know, Electric Ladyland. I just thought it was great. Those three, for me, are the best ones, but, you know, I had all the other ones, too, you know. I'm not the biggest Buddy Miles fan in the world. I appreciate him, and I liked his playing in electric, on the Electric Flag album. You know, I think that's pretty good. Um, but he is, even on that record, he's a little bit sloppy and heavy handed in a kind of not so appealing manner, you know, as a drummer. He, he's obviously hitting really hard. A friend of mine, I got to tell this story. A friend of mine was playing in a nightclub in uh, Hawaii, and uh, Jimi Hendrix came to town. And Buddy Miles was playing with him at that time, I think. But Buddy was with him. I don't know if they were playing together or if they were on the same bill. I'm not sure. But they were both in town. My friend's playing in this nightclub. And it's late, you know, and Buddy Miles walks in. And one thing lead, led to another. He gets up and sits in with the band. He knocked a hole in the snare drum head. Right, right, and the first song, and then turned it over 
and played the bottom head and knocked a hole in it too. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, he, and he got up and, to leave and he said, man, I feel real bad about that. And he gave the guy 20 bucks, you know, and this is like back in 69 or 70 or something, you know, and, um, which was a lot of money then, you know. And so the guy was all right, you know, and, and he, and he left. And, um, he said that we were playing and Jimi Hendrix opened the door of the place and looks in and goes like this. He goes, and closed the door, <laughs> you know, <laughs> while they were playing, you know, and it was like, and my friend saw him play a couple of times in Hawaii. And, uh, but anyway, uh, he said that one, he said that, so they're, they're playing and they, you know, it's about an hour goes by and Buddy Miles comes back in and he's trashed. And he comes up to the stage and says, hey, man, I need that 20 back. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man, I need that $20 back. <laughs> I don't think the guy gave it to him. 